We come to our last message in the, in the series in Micah. Uh, my thanks to Pastor Daryl and Pastor Brad in my uh, absence the last two weeks. Two weeks ago, we had a membership class. Some of you were there. We had 31 come to the membership class. It was fantastic. Uh, many of them are, are seeking to join our church and become a, become a part of what we're doing here. And then this past week, my wife Laura and I were uh, away dropping our youngest off at college uh, for orientation. We are actually empty nesters now. I'm not sure if I like that or not. Um, well, we have the dogs, so there's that. Um, but no children uh, in the home any longer. So we, uh, we look forward to what God has in this, in this new chapter. But I thank those guys for, for speaking uh, in my absence, and, and I'm excited about finishing up this series of messages today. Chapter 7, verses, first of all, we'll begin with verses 1 through 7. Woe is me, for I have become as when the summer fruit has been gathered, as when the grapes have been gleaned, there is no cluster to eat, no first ripe fig that my soul desires. The godly has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among mankind. They all lie in wait for blood. Each hunts the other with a net. Their hands are on what is evil to do it well. The prince and the judge ask for a bribe. The great man utters the evil desire of his soul. Thus they weave it together. The best of them is like a briar, the most upright of them a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman, of your punishment has come. Now their confusion is at hand. Put no trust in a neighbor, have no confidence in a friend. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. For the son treats the father with no um, with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Man's enemies are the men of his own house. Now, if we continued in this direction, I mean, this, this is not encouraging words. These are words of great frustration, and, and these words paint a picture of the evil that is taking place in, in Micah's day and how you can trust no one, and everyone is absolutely terrible. But then comes verse 7. I love verse 7. But, remember, whenever you see that word, look around for God in Scripture. But, as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. The first thing I want you to see about this passage is the injunction, the encouragement here to look to the Lord. Number one, look to the Lord. The summary of these first seven verses your life and all those around you are terrible. Nothing is good. But, but, verse 7 reminds us that God is good, so look to Him. This section reflects how we can sometimes feel. When things are not going well, when, when a job is lost, when a, when a diagnosis is given, when finances are out of control, when a child is wayward, when a marriage is struggling, and on and on, you, you could list your own issues here. It can begin to feel like everything is falling apart and nothing is good and everything is terrible. And then over time, living that way causes you to think that everyone lives that way and everyone views the world that way. I mean, you know, I'm not paranoid. People really are out to get me. Life is not just sort of bad. It's absolutely terrible. And everyone else agrees with what I'm saying, right? So we can get into this funk where we think that. But the Word of God here is reminding us, while, while things on earth are bad, in this world you will have trouble. And Micah is reminding the, the children of God about that. Maybe they've forgotten that. But he reminds also of the goodness of God. He reminds also that we are to look to God, not at our circumstances, not at our trouble. It doesn't mean that we're unaware of our trouble. We're certainly aware of it, but we, we look to the Lord. The Lord has the answer for us. He goes on in verses 8 through 10. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my cause and executes judgment for me. He will bring me out to the light. I shall look upon his vindication. Then my enemy will see, and shame will cover her who said to me, Where is the Lord your God? My eyes will look upon her. Now she will be trampled down like the mire of the streets. And so he's reminding the prophet here with very strong language, is reminding that, yes, the world is evil. Yes, our sin brings the judgment of God. Remember, this series of messages talks about the justice of God on the one hand and the compassion of God on the other. 
And so it is true that the justice of God will, will roll out. But it's also true, and he's ending the story, or the writing here in chapter 7, he's ending with the understanding of this compassion and this mercy and this grace that God gives. It is also true that, number two, the Lord is your light. When everything seems dark, the Lord is your light. The Lord has an eternal clock, and that's difficult for us. We do not view our lives, generally speaking, through an eternal viewfinder. Consider the Lord. The Bible teaches that He is eternal, meaning He has always been and He will always be. If if God has always been and He will always be, it stands to reason that he views things very differently than we do. Even when we come to know Christ and we recognize, okay, the Bible teaches that I will live forever, that, that God gives me, because of the cross, he, he gives me eternal life, forgiveness, the lordship of God. It, it leads to eternal life in his presence forever and ever and ever. And, and we say those things, but we still think in a finite way because we live in a finite world. So we think about the next hours, we think about the next days, we think about the next weeks. Just a moment ago, I asked you to pray that we hit the July 15th date for the building of our building. So we think with calendars, we think with days and times and constraints of time. Even if we think of a lifetime, it still has a period at the end of the sentence, either because of the return of Christ or our own death. There is a day coming when we will no longer be here. And so we think that way. We, we think in a very limited way. God doesn't think that way. And so when, it, when things appear to be unraveling in our world, could it be that God's greater purpose, which ties to eternity, not just to a few years, is being unfolded in us, through us, sometimes in spite of us? It's impossible for us um, to think the way the Lord thinks. I'm, I'm not asking you to do that. But I am reminding you that, that when we come into the presence of God, He holds us and keeps us and encourages us even when we can't fully understand what's going on. So the Lord has this eternal clock and and, and we don't. So so we are prone to, I'll just call it spiritual depression. There are seasons in our lives when things seem so dark because of what's happening. And we drift, even those of us who know God, we we drift from our, our close connection to Him. We don't ultimately leave Him because He holds us but we we do drift and we can come to the place where we believe there is no light until we get to heaven and and that is patently untrue god meets us at our point of need all the time so so what do we do well first of all we have to stay in the light we have to stay in the light um i was recently um i got up in the middle of the night I heard a sound uh, in the house I woke up I I got up while I was up I thought well I'll go to the bathroom since I'm up and I'm already up doing something so I'm making my way down the little hallway in our bedroom that leads to the bathroom and I had forgotten that I had placed uh, we had been traveling I had placed a suitcase there totally dark I mean I know that path I don't ever turn the lights on when I'm doing that I hit that suitcase I didn't fall but you know And it it appeared seemingly out of nowhere. Well, if I had turned on the light, I would have seen it, right? I would have walked around it. I would have known that it was there. The the Lord is our light. He, He guides us in paths of righteousness for his namesake. But when we do not appropriate the light, we miss understanding the path that God has for us. How do you do that? I think there are, there are three simple ways that we appropriate the light. These aren't the only ways, but, but these very quickly come to my mind. Read God's Word. Read it every day. The Word of God brings light and wisdom into our lives. So read God's Word. Ask God to, to reveal truths to you from His Word. Pray. Spend time talking to God, laying your burdens before him, asking for his counsel and his wisdom, praying for others to receive his counsel and his wisdom. 
as we interact with God and pray, he, he reveals to us an understanding that we would not otherwise have, and he shows us his path. He, in a sense, opens our eyes to see the light. And then last, I would say, come together with God's people, others who have the light of God. Hang out with people who love Jesus. God calls us to do that. We learn from each other. Because here's what I have learned through the years. We're not all down at the same time. And that is really good news. Some of us are down some of the time. But all of us are not down all of the time. So as we come together with God's people, and I walk into a gathering, it could be a meal at someone's house with God's people, it could be right here on Sunday morning and as the congregation, and I, I come together to rub elbows with God's people, and I'm having a really bad day, or week, or year, and I'm just down, and I intellectually say, yes, Jesus is the light, yes, he, he paid for my sins on the cross, yes, I, I believe that God's word is true, but it's, it's more of an intellectual thing. It's, it's, it's not breathing in my life right now. Then the body of Christ can come around me and flesh pile me and say, you're not thinking straight. What you feel is not truth always. This is truth always. What Jesus did on the cross is truth always. When the Bible says that he will never leave us or forsake us, that is true. Even if you don't feel like it, it's true. And we need other people to speak into our lives. Well, the world doesn't believe that. And we interact with the world a lot. We have to. It's just the nature of where we live. Jesus said, be in the world, but not of it. And so we, we are in the world. But the church, that's the group that can speak into us words of hope, words of encouragement, words of truth. And because we live in the world, we need the church to speak those words of truth into us. So, look to the Lord. The Lord is your light. Verses 11 through 13. A day for the building of your walls. In that day the boundaries shall be far extended. In that day they will come to you from Assyria and the cities of Egypt and from Egypt to the river, from sea to sea and from mountain to mountain. But the earth will be desolate because of its inhabitants for the fruit of their deeds. The third thing is this. The Lord's kingdom will grow. The Lord's kingdom will grow. Keep following after Christ. A day is coming when people will turn to God and follow him as never before. Until that day, remain steadfast, remain faithful. He will accomplish his full purpose in and through our broken lives. I never cease to be amazed that God chooses people to accomplish his purposes. I'm not really sure why, but he does. And we are broken and messed up and dysfunctional, but he uses us anyway. Verse 14. Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your inheritance, who dwell alone in a forest in the midst of a garden land. Let them graze in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old. As in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show them marvelous things. The nations shall see and be ashamed of all their might. They shall lay their hands on their mouths. Their ears shall be deaf. They shall lick the dust like a serpent, like the crawling things of the earth. They shall come trembling out of their strongholds. They shall turn in dread to the Lord our God, and they shall be in fear of you. This is the writer. This is Micah beseeching, making a petition to God to shepherd his people. And what does the Lord do there? Well, the Lord responds with the illustration of the children of Israel leaving Egypt, the Exodus that we read about in the book of Exodus and other places. He will lead, he will guide, he will shepherd. He still is doing that and he will continue to do that until he returns to bring the sheep home. That's us. There is a day coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. So the Lord, number four, is a good shepherd. The Lord is a good shepherd. We have that picture uh, written throughout the New Testament. We understand his heart and his life, and we need that. And Micah is reminding us of that. And then last, in verses 18 through 20, who is a God like you? Uh, I love it that Micah ends. Micah sort of began with a very heavy, harsh, pointed, uh, judgmental word. You are sinners. You are evil. You have run from God, you need to come back to the truth, and on and on and on. And he, he spends a lot of energy and a lot of words saying that same message over and over again. But he ends on the compassion side, which I so appreciate. 
Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He doesn't delight in anger, but he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all your sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. So the last thing is this, the Lord is loving, compassionate, and faithful. The Lord is loving, compassionate, and faithful. These verses show the the worshiping hearts of the remnant of God. It is no different today. The true followers of God recognize that he is loving, he is compassionate, he is faithful. He is incapable of being any other way. That's who he is. Um, we, we sing the song that he is a good, good father. That is so true. And we need that good, good father. We need the forgiveness that only he can give. We need the direction that only he can provide. Um, we, we need the hope that can only be found in Christ. And so as we come now to consider the truth of God and to just pray and contemplate about these truths, ask God, Lord, what is it that you want from me? Where are you leading? If you're a Christ follower, ask him to to show and to reveal the next steps that he has for your life because your life is a part of his eternal purpose. How would God use you to make a difference in the lives of others? And if you don't yet know him, ask God, as we sing in just a moment, ask God to to reveal the truth of his nature to you. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much for um, the love that you have provided for us in that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. Your your compassion, your extended arms toward us reveal to us your character and remind us of our need for a Savior. We are sinners, it is true. There is no one righteous among us, not one. Um, but Lord, you, you have provided a way where there is no way. And so I, I pray for, for anyone who is here today that, that does not yet know you as Lord and Savior, I pray that you would draw them to the truth, draw them to the cross, give them your grace as only you can do. Bring them to an everlasting hope which is found in you alone. And do it even as we we sing uh, the words of this next song. Lord, I also also pray for those of us who do know you, who do have a relationship with you. We, We confess that we struggle and doubt at times. But that's all on us, not on you. And so we we pray, God, that you would encourage us and strengthen us and give us your wisdom and and renew, as, as David prayed in the Psalms, renew unto us, restore unto us the joy of our salvation. Pray that that would happen uh, to us even today if, if we are struggling in some way, that we would never, ever get over what you have accomplished for us on the cross. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Would you stand, please? We're going to sing together, and as we do, if if God has laid a burden on your heart, uh, a need for prayer for you or or for someone else, we invite you to come and and spend some time here in prayer asking God to do what only He can do in in whatever the situation is. He loves to hear the prayers of His people. And uh, I'll be standing here off to the side if if you'd like to talk with me more about what it means to begin this journey of faith and, and receive the grace God has provided for you. It would be my joy to talk with you more about that. We'll sing together. You come as God leads. All things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the cornerstone. Things that we hold. Again, you cause your sun to shine in the darkest nights. For all that you've done, we will pour out a love. This will be our anthem song. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we 
Sweet love. 